good to be here and <clears throat> to be able to serve God with you as we present God's word to you. I invite you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 34. <coughs> ah. mm. Deuteronomy 34, <clears throat> beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> there we go. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. <clears throat> then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I, will, I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses the servant of the Lord died there in Moab as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. We thank God for his word. May it penetrate us and fill us with his grace and his mercy. It is the end of an, an era, so to speak. Pastor Mike Walker had served here for 15, 16 years. And now he is no longer the pastor here. And we are in a time of transition, a time of change, and moving from one to another. And that time of transition is always a disconcerting thing for us humans. We don't always like when change comes upon us. Even some good change, when things are removed that we didn't want there, it still creates this tension in this transition that just... Yeah. What do we do with all that? But I'm here to say that God has helped His people in times in the past through such transitions. And since our God is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow forever, He's there. He is the same. How He worked in the past and how He helped the Israelites through this time of leadership transition, He's willing to help the people at Bowmansdale through their time of transition as well. And so it's wise for us to look in to see what God did then and learn from that to see how He will even help us today. And so let me go back and make sure that we're all on the same page here with this, with, with Moses you know, the people of Israel, they had been, what, slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and now they have been wandering through the wilderness for 40 years, and now they're right at the Jordan River, ready to cross over, but one thing has to happen before they can cross over into the Promised Land. One thing has to happen, and that one thing that must happen is that Moses, their leader, must die. Now, do you remember why he had to die before they could cross in? 
He hit a rock. Ow, I gotta, I gotta work on that. Or get softer pulpits or something. I don't know. He hit a rock. Did he hurt the rock when he hit the rock? He used the staff. Did he hurt the staff when he hit the rock? No, you got ahead. You told me he disobeyed, and that's what he did. That's why he had to die before he crossed over into it. God said, speak to the rock. The previous time, God said, strike the rock with your staff, and water would come out of it. And this time, when the people were grumbling about having no water, God simply said, speak to it. And because he hit an inanimate rock which did not hurt it or the staff, he has to die. I don't like that. Just, just being straight up. I, I, I don't like that consequence. I don't, I don't really think that's fair. Maybe we'll go back to Sunday school class in a little bit there. It's not really fair. I don't like that. But it does remind me and us that when we disobey God, there is a consequence. You know, when we plucked that fruit from the tree, there was a consequence for Adam as well as Eve. When we disobey God's command upon our lives, there is a consequence for us. There is a separation from God when we do that. And we don't always like and we may even say it's not fair when those things come upon us. But it also shows that God is faithful to who he is in this because he said that Moses would not cross over. And so God is not wishy-washy. He says something. He stays true to his word. And so Moses does not cross over. It also shows to us that 400 years ago he had made this promise to Abraham that the people would inherit this land, and they are going to inherit the land. this land. God is faithful because He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change. He is consistent. In verse 6, we're told that God buried him there in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day, no one knows where his grave is. We're told there before that he went up on this Mount of Pisgah and he was able to look across and see the land. He was able to look 60 miles west to the Mediterranean Sea. He was able to look 90 miles north up to the Sea of Galilee and up into the Mountain Carmel. And he could see the land. <clears throat> He's 120 years old at the time. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Uh, yeah, a month ago I was up with my wife in Alaska and at 400 yards there were some doll sheep up there so I was told when I got my 10 power binoculars out I confirmed that yes those little white dots way up there were really doll sheep how do you see 60 miles or 90 miles at 120, and I ain't there yet, not even half of that yet, but getting closer. <laughs> really closer. Right. I'm not sure how God enabled him to see that, but he was able to see it. And we're told that his eyes were not failing nor his strength weak. He could, continue, he could have continued in the work. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that it was time for someone else to come in and lead them in an entire new way into this new promised land. It was a time for a change in leadership. But I wonder, over these last 40 years, how many sleepless nights he had dealing with these 2 million men, 2 million women, and who knows how many more children. That's, that's a lot of people to... to, to oversee. I can only think back to my time as pastor at Roaring Spring and I was there for 20 years and, and there were so many times I, I wish we were here but we were still here. I wish we were there but we were still here and we were struggling with this and, and I just know how many sleepless nights I had. And there were still things that we wanted to, to go on before and, and one of the things was we were working on the sanctuary. We got the walls painted, new carpet, 
the, the stage was about the size of, of this, and so I got it bumped out a little bit, but that cost a pew. That almost cost my life. Uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, we also had a temporary stream, but we wanted a permanent stream that could go up and down, and, and, and we would have to project from the back. And we, we were working on that. And my last Sunday there was August 15th, 2008. Does anyone want to harbor a guess as to when the screen was operational? <laughs> August 16th, 2008. They were there the Friday before. They had it all ready to go. They were missing one part. And it was an hour drive back to the shop. And they wouldn't do that for me. And so I was complaining about that, grumbling to God about that, and God had this way of reminding me that, Dave, you know what? That screen was never about you anyway. Okay. You know, I'd been working nine years to get at that point, and well, the next pastor got to enjoy it, and I've been able to go back and preach a couple times, and been able to enjoy that, and the screen in the back, and that's what I really wanted to enjoy. The people enjoy that screen. I enjoyed that, and I didn't have to go like this every time, all right? And there were some other things that I dreamed about that there would be a third worship service and that got started a year later and some other things. And, you know, I share that to say that the dream doesn't stop just because one leader ends and another one comes in. There is more to go on. We're told that Moses did die. Then we're told that the people mourned. They grieved for 30 days. When there is loss in our life, it, it is normal for us to grieve. In our culture, we're, we're, we're given three days off of work, and then you're back to work, and everything's supposed to be just the way it was before. What a fallacy. They took 30 days, and I'm not even sure that 30 days is enough time to walk through all of our grieves, especially when someone is very close to us. And it's true, what's true for an individual is true for a group, that when a leader leaves, like Pastor Mike, who's been here for so long, and he's impacted us in many different ways, at many different levels, that we'll be in a time of grieving and mourning, and we walk through that in different paces. Some will go through that quite quickly, and some will still be there months, if, if not years. I, I, I can still recall after I'd been at Roaring Spring for three years, there were still some people grieving that Pastor Stone had left and I was there. And that's just the way it is. That we walk this pace at different paths. And so it's, it's okay to feel this sorrow or to feel anger or to feel just, where are we? And we walk through it at different paces. But we eventually we come around and we, we agree to move forward. And so that is where we are at at this time. It, it, as Rolling Spring was walking through that transition themselves 11 years ago, um, they, they thought that, well, I left August 15th. They thought that by September 1, they'd have their next pastor because it always had worked that way. Uh, it wasn't working that way. I'd been there for 20 years. They didn't need a new pastor two weeks after I was gone. They needed some time away to, to breathe, and they didn't like that. They especially didn't like it that I told them that. And by November, when they hadn't found the next pastor, they were really starting to grumble not quite like the Israelites in the wilderness, but they were grumbling nonetheless. And at December, over Christmas break, one of the, the young ladies, one of the girls who was a Messiah student at that point in time, she went home. And she was a junior in college, and she went home and she listened to her mom and her dad. Her, her, her dad was one of the elders. Her mom was a treasure. So they were in to know what was going on. And mom and dad were grumbling about how they just hadn't been able to get any good candidates, and they didn't have the pastor yet. They figured, well, now they would, and the conference would provide that. And they were grumbling. And, and this 20-year-old uh, looks at mom and dad and says, uh, God already knows his name. We just have to figure out who that is. God already knows his name. And all I can think is, 
I hate it when the kids are right. <laughs> Don't you hate it when the kids are right? Hey, man. Oh, but how true. God already knew the name of the next pastor, and now God already knows the name of the next pastor at Roaring Spring, and he'll probably, he already knows who the next one is, and this next one hasn't even started yet, but all right, we won't get into that, all right? But God already knows the name of the next pastor here at, at Bowmansdale, and now we're just in this process of discerning who that is. And that's part of re my reason why I come here today is to help us understand that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and how he helped us in the past, how he helped the Israelites in the past, he helps us today. One of the things I want to point out here from Joshua, about Joshua, is that there in verse 9, we're told that Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. He was filled with the spirit of wisdom. And so as we are searching for this next person who God already knows, there are certain things that we definitely have to be looking for. And one is this characteristic that this person, man or woman, I'll, I'll keep using he just because it's easier for me and that goes back to the story, that he must be filled with the spirit of wisdom. God's spirit must be upon this person or we will flounder. And God must have called this person to this place at this time for this season. God places his hand. He uses humans to do that. But God is with us. In some ways, this next pastor will be like Pastor Mike. One who proclaims the word with authority and with power. One who has a passion for lost people. In many ways, this next person will be entirely different than Pastor Mike, because just as Joshua was different than Moses. Joshua was not one who went up and spoke with God face to face. He was not the one who brought the Ten Commandments down. He was there with Moses, but he was different. He was not the one who had, was used by God to bring about these ten plagues. That's not what is needed now as they go into this new land. An entirely different style of leadership is needed now to move us forward into where is God, God's going to be taking us over these next 10, 20, 30, 50, 5,000 years. I don't know how long we're going to be here until Jesus comes. And I won't be here 5,000 years from now. I don't know. It's not really long. But as a conference, we're here to work together to help you in this process so you're not alone in this journey. Uh, the, within the Eastern Regional Conference, there is the Credentialing and Placement Commission, and this whole idea of credentialing and placement being put together is still kind of new for us. We've been doing it for just a, about a year and a half. It had been two different commissions and now merged into one. And so we're working through this, but it's, it's working. And so we'll have a, a placement rep who will work with you. I am this, one of the staff people who work with that. Nick D. Francisco, the executive director, is one and I'm one. It's the only commission that has two staff people working with it at the same time. That's interesting in and of itself, too. But then there's placement reps who will be working with you, and uh, most likely it will be George Jensen, who is the pastor of Enola, and then there will be some others who were training to come along with you as well. You're in a nice central location, so you may get a lot of helpers, all right, as we're trying to teach and raise up some new, new. But George has been working with several churches, and so he'll probably take the lead. And at this point in time, I step back because now there's two other brand new churches who just came open that I'll be working with them as well, as well as the other seven. There's about 10 churches open at any point in time, okay? And that's the way it's been for the last five years, and I project that's the way it's going to be for the next 10 years. There's a lot of us getting close to 60, 65, all right? And that's where we're at right now. But the good news is through the ministerial training course, we have many people who are coming up and coming in, and so it's an ever-flowing message. We're, we're all temporary here, pastors included. And so how will we help you through this process in, in that we've already met with game and met with the council and talked with them. We'll be continuing in that process. Um, one of the things that we offer is that of an intentional interim, and we've been able to designate one and place one, uh, and that's going to be Ed Rosenberry, 
who maybe some of you have heard of. He had been the former uh, conference superintendent and executive director for conference pastor was his title then. And so he'll be able to start here after October 15th. All right. Uh, he's currently the intentional interim at Everly's Mill. And so you've hung out with him some, all right? Or he's hung out with your boy a little bit, all right? And so when he wraps up there, then he'll come over here. And that's a little bit closer for him. He will not be here full time. Uh, we'll still be working on that. So that means that in some ways, we're going to have to be caring for things because ministry continues on. It does not end. There will be surgeries. Even this week. People who have needs, there are... Sunday school class is still to be taught. There are other activities that must go on. And so we continue, but it's not just pastor driven, is it? We're a body where we work together. And so there's many opportunities for different people to step up and to step into places where they hadn't been able to before or didn't need to or didn't think they could, but now they can. And so how do we work together to be this body that God has put together here for the blessing of this community. One of the things that we as a body must do and we can all be involved in is that is praying for that person who God already knows by name. And to be praying for the council as they walk through this transition and then pray for the search team as that is put together and they take the lead on bringing this in. Uh, the intentional interim, we say, is, will be here for s up to 11 months. It can be 18. It might be 24. That's stretching out. It usually doesn't take that long. It's usually 10 to uh, 14 months, somewhere in that range. You know, it, it's kind of fluid that way. And, and that's a norm. And so if it takes that long, don't get stressed out if it takes a little bit longer than that. If it goes quicker than it, then I get stressed out because I, I, we need this time to, to grieve and to, to breathe and then to be able to move forward. Because I've just found that to be healthier. So, okay. Now, some other things. Dur even before this search team is put together, it's, you know, Ed will be coming together and he'll be inviting different groups of people together and he'll be talking to different people just trying to figure out, where are we? Who is the Bowmansdale Church of God? Because he, he has a sense, but he doesn't fully know and wants to find out now. And as we put this together, there will be some chances to meet and also for some surveys. And so that's a chance for you to take part and to help the search team figure out this is where we're at and this is, these are the characteristics, the competencies that we're looking forward to in the next pastor. And then... The other th important thing is that just to keep the people informed of, through the process. Now let me just walk through this. After the search team is put together, and then they're going to be forming a, a, a job description, so to speak. And then they'll be asking for resumes to come in. And so as those processes come in, just inform Gaiman, just as council president, if you're still the council president next year, I don't know how that all works, but whoever the council president, inform the people. Let them know this is where we're at so that they can be in prayer for that because we just want to know. And, and we like that information. So, so there's the resumes and then after that's the interviews and I recommend that there's no more than three interviews. After that, it just gets too stretched out. In, in a job setting, we can do multiple interviews in one week. In a church setting, we basically do one interview a week and then there's in a week and then we're all on vacation and then it's the third week and it, it just... We move slower in the church for multiple reasons. And then there will probably be a, a trial sermon after that, which people will know about. And then there will be a selection. And then we'll work through uh, the actual transition from intentional interim to the next called pastor. So that's the basic process that we'll be walking through as we discern who God already knows. Josh was put in place and the people moved into the promised land and they were able to inherit what God had already given to them centuries before. And as we are in this time of transition, 
God has helped the Israelites through their time of transition. And we know that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And how he helped them is the same way that he helps us. And so we walk in this journey into the very presence of Jesus, allowing him to transform us into the very image of Jesus Christ because that is who he's made us to be, just like his son, Jesus. We humans don't like change, and we even like transition less. But the beauty of it is being transformed into the very image of Jesus. Where's Dolly? Is she back there? Oh, there she is. What's your favorite critter? What's my favorite critter? Yeah, you told me about it beforehand. Butterflies, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Whew, don't leave me hanging there for a moment, all right? <laughs> Butterflies. They go through multiple transformations before they become this butterfly, don't they? Yeah. I remember the image that my mom had in the WCSC back in the 70s when I was a kid, that whole butterfly. Yeah. And we are in this transition stage, being made into something very beautiful. I don't know what a butterfly feels while it's going through that cocoon or chrysalis or, or those other stages, but I know what our reaction is when the butterfly becomes a butterfly. And we are in that process, again, of being changed into the very image of Jesus. So I pray for you. I pray God's grace upon you. I pray his blessing upon you that as the children of God, that you may experience a newness, something that you have never, like something you have never experienced before. That you will come out of it even greater and stronger because God's and God's Spirit has walked you through this time of, of trial. Because in that trial, there is joy as He transforms us into who He's always dreamed us of being. Blessings to you and peace as we live in the God. For he is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, we do trust in you and we are grateful for your promises for they are sure and they are confirmed in the very image of Jesus Christ who left all the glories in heaven to come to earth that we may be with you. May we walk forth this day into your presence, into your love, into your mercy and your grace. Spirit, guide us and speak to us. May we always learn of your love. In the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.